which we're not content, the contents have it. Question for short debate. New action plan for offenders, Baroness Burt of Selihull. My Lords, uh, I'm most grateful for the opportunity to bring this issue before your Lordship's House today. Lady Hamway, uh, my uh, noble friend, who originally managed to secure this debate, has stood by to allow others more time to speak, as clearly this is an important issue which noble Lords feel strongly about, given the number have put their names down to speak today. I'm going to follow her lead uh, by being as brief as possible uh, in my remarks. Firstly, can I heartily welcome the report of the House of Commons Justice yeah. Committee uh, on uh, IPP sentences. The report pulls no punches in its description of the dysfunctionality of the current IPP system and the mental toll it takes on those trapped within it. And it makes clear that unless considerable resources and improvements to the system are employed, the current rump of 3,300 or so IPP prisoners, either on recall uh, or never having been released at all, will not diminish significantly any time soon. I don't want to spend time going into the history of how we got here today, only to say that since 2016 several action plans have been implemented but progress, to put it mildly, has been slow. The current plan focuses on 15 different work streams, each of which seeks to tra tackle a different aspects of the problem, like mental health issues, progressive transfers and so on. But this is clearly ineffective without resources and without regular monitoring, reviewing and evaluation of the effectiveness of the different programmes. So the report recommends a fresh action plan to include clear performance measures for each work stream, someone actually accountable and a time frame for completion of each activity. Then we'll know what the targets are and we'll be able to measure how effectively they're working within the target timescales. They recommended this revised plan to be published by around March 2023. Now, I've got to tell the uh, noble Lord, the Minister, that uh, I've got a lot of questions, um, and if he's unable to answer any of them today, would he kindly undertake to write to me and other, other noble lords here today with the answers. So, on the new action plan recommendations, my first question of the noble lord the minister is, uh, is the government currently working on a new action plan along the lines of the joint committee's recommendations? And will they at least aspire to meet the timescales for, produ for producing the plan uh, recommended in this report. Will the plan include clear performance measures for each work stream? And will someone be held accountable for performance within a specific time frame? Secondly, uh, the report is graphic in its psychological, uh, on the, sorry, on the psychological harm uh, caused by IPP sentences. Will the MOG and the, uh, and the HMPPS set out how they intend to improve access to mental health support? And will the government publish the commissioned report by Professor Paul Moran into the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway by this December, as the Joint Committee uh, report recommends? Thirdly, Another major inhibitor to progress is the lack of appropriate parole preparation courses. Long waiting lists add time to sentences before the prisoner can even reach the starting gate for assessment. Will the MOJ and the HMPPS ensure that there are enough places on courses? Fourthly, 
there's the whole system of managing the release into the community uh, and the parole system. Will sufficient resources be made available to, cur to curtail the inordinate delays in helping to prepare prisoners for parole? Will the, will the parole system prioritise consideration of IPP prisoners? And will more help be made available to enable prisoners who've been released uh, to make a success of life on the other side of the bars? So all these recommendations deal with the system as it stands. But, my lords, the report goes further, much further. The committee recommends a reduction in the qualifying licence period from 10 years to five. Our doughty uh, cross-party team of peers, whom I, uh, many of whom I see uh, around uh, in the chamber today, uh, worked on, who worked on the uh, Police Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill earlier this year, argued strongly for this. And I hope the government has had time to reflect and see that it can make a big difference without compromising public safety. The final primary and most radical recommendation of the report is to end the plight of those still suffering from this cruel, inhumane sentence altogether by conducting a resentencing exercise with a small, time-limited expert committee and members of the senior ju judiciary. I don't propose to speculate on how exactly this would work. I do know it won't be easy, but this terrible, unjust treatment of prisoners must end. My final question is, will the government look at the feasibility of creating this committee and how it might go about its work? I commend Bob Neill and uh, his committee. They took the brave step of showing a path to end this sentence. They haven't consigned the solution to the too difficult box, my lords, and neither should we. Yeah. Yeah. It was a masterly introduction to this debate, and I'm honoured to follow it. As Lady Burt says, this report is greatly to be welcomed. Uh, your Lordship's House has, uh, I sense, long recognised the shocking injustices suffered by all those sentenced under this scheme. Uh, injustices still continuing, indeed growing now, ten years after its uh, abolition. But we've hitherto uh, rather been given to understand that the other place, the all-powerful uh, elected chamber, is uh, unpersuadable. Uh, they don't have the appetite, we've been told, to uh, um, change the law in a way which could put at liberty um, uh, some who could reoffend, who are currently, however unfairly um, uh, most of us regard it, uh, uh, are, are lawfully locked up. But now this House of Commons report uh, is not so hard-hearted, uh, uh, but nor is it soft-hearted, rather it's hard-headed and it, uh, it contains a masterly analysis uh, of the wrong and what is necessary to put it right with this uh, system. At last, it's recognised that the scheme uh, <coughs> has resulted in a gross injustice. Uh, life, uh, IPP sentences are life sentences, effectively, by the back door. The committee themselves describe it as preventive detention, imprisoning people uh, for what they might do rather than what they've done. And the only uh, actual long-term final solution, as the committee recognises, is for those um, uh, still affected uh, <coughs> to be uh, uh, re-sentenced uh, according to just uh, principles. And, of course, everybody who ever uh, was sentenced to an IPP sentence as between, that is, April 2005 and December 2010 under its abolition, prospectively, in Lasbo, they're all still subject to this injustice, not only those still uh, detained, many for uh, years beyond tariff dates, uh, several beyond their statutory maximum for the offending, but everybody, and that's a total uh, um, of 8,711 IPPs, 
the only exceptions being that tiny handful who finally have secured the discharge of their licenses by definition following 10 years after their initial uh, release. Uh, all these are to be regarded as victims of an unjust scheme desperately needing far greater help than most of them have currently uh, been getting in order to secure and then to retain at long last their liberty. Uh, <clears throat> so what's needed now as the committee recognises an intensive, well-resourced new uh, scheme uh, to maximise, uh, custom-built to maximise their prospects of safe and sustainable release for this whole cohort of our unfortunate fellow citizens. The report points the way ahead. Yeah. My Lords, uh, in a short debate such as this, uh, it's often not possible to say anything at all, and certainly not anything original, but my two predecessor speakers, the Noble and Learned Lord uh, and the Noble Lady, and I congratulate her on achieving this debate, have demonstrated that my first premise is wrong, uh, and I congratulate them for what they had to say. Uh, that said, I happily refer once again to my connections to the Prison Reform Trust and a few other charities connected to the welfare of prisoners. <coughs> and pay tribute to the small band of noble and noble and learned lords, uh, many of whom are taking part in this debate, who have kept the continuing injustice of indeterminate sentences for public protection before your Lordship's house, uh, before the government, uh, and elsewhere. I make a couple of points. First, the uh, Common Select Committee report is a powerful document, as the noble lady has made clear. It needs to be taken seriously by the government and not just put into the too difficult file. The government must act quickly on those recommendations that can be dealt with now and make a solemn promise, despite the many other matters on the public agenda, to produce a plan or schedule to deal with those recommendations that will take a bit more time. But whatever the timetable, the work must start now. Procrastination or equivocation will no longer satisfy the need for justice to be done and for hope to be restored to all those still incarcerated many, many years after their tariffs expired. The burden of proof is, my lords, very much on the government to show why no or little action is the answer and why those still in prison beyond their tariff or who have already served longer than the maximum for the underlying sentence uh, the underlying offence, uh, should not be released. Second point, historians can occasionally identify watershed moments in the past which turned events. There have been debates or books or public events which, it can be said, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, influenced or even catalyzed the course of history. Is it too fanciful to ask my noble and learned friend, the Advocate General, to recognise that we are now at a time when the government must do things about IPPs, which in the future can be seen to have made that real and civilising difference. This sentence, which the noble Lord Lord Blunkett has bravely admitted should never have been enacted, was abolished ten years ago. Let us strike out now and clear its foul stench from our justice system. If our forebears stopped sending children up chimneys and abolished slavery, I rather think that we can get rid of the remaining injustices caused by IPPs. Can I see a Wilberforce or a Shaftesbury on the Treasury bench? Well, my lords, uh, I look oh, like my, the Lord, noble Lord, Lord Garnier for a sign that the... the the, the, the message has got home. The injustice should never have happened in the first place. But having happened, surely there is a very, very heavy burden upon the state to rectify what for what the injustice it is responsible. And so I do hope that this reminder today if it is needed, and I hope it's not, and it goes home and persuades 
the house and the, those responsible in this area of government that enough has been enough. My Lords, may I pay tribute to the noble Baroness in securing this debate and also to Lord Blunkett, who has admitted this was a mistake. I have three points I want to make. First, we have now got what is essential for policy, which is an evidence-based report. The committee listened to everyone on all sides. And secondly, it has produced a clear analysis. And the conclusion from that analysis is clear, namely that although there are a few people who present an ongoing danger for a long time, <coughs> the vast majority's position needs reconsideration as incarcerating them for longer makes the public at greater risk. The second point is we must bring to an end delay, procrastination and failing to grasp the problem. It is a very long standing. When I visited Leeds Prison in February 2006, that is some months after the sentence had been introduced, it was clear that the problems that have emerged were already apparent. There is no excuse for the inordinate and inexcusable delay. And the report sets out with absolute clarity the effect of inaction. But inaction in many cases some, uh, does not necessarily make the position worse. But inaction in this case has made the position worse. I have sat on cases where it is self-evident that the terms of the IPP sentence have made the prisoner more dangerous, and that we cannot go on with. The reasons are set out with the utmost clarity. They are completely accurate, and I need say no more. Thirdly, I welcome all the solutions, but in the time, can I say something about the solution of resentencing? This was first raised with the government by me in 2010, so it's nothing new. Secondly, there are very good examples of where the judiciary and the government have worked together to get sentencing right. The 2012 Act was got right with such work, save for this one problem. And thirdly, the experience of dealing with resentencing on murder in which I had a role to play, has worked. And although there are difficulties, they can be overcome. Therefore, I urge the Minister, use an evidence-based report, don't delay and don't procrastinate, and at long last, achieve justice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my Lords, it's, it's, it's an honour to uh, follow the... Uh, noble and learned Lord, I, I read yesterday his judgment in the Roberts case in, in 2016, um, in which the Court of Appeal described the circumstances of various offences which had led to the imposition of, of uh, uh, various offences which had led to the imposition of IPP sentences in, in the relevant period. And I was left reflecting. The, the Court, for the reasons explained by its decision, had to um, reject the appeals because they were not good appeals as a matter of law. But, but I was left reflecting that those individual offenders who had committed offences which were certainly serious, they were not trivial offences, but they were far from being the most serious types of offence that come before the courts, those offenders, if still in prison, and some of them may well still be in prison, um, would have been sitting in prison for now 15 years or so, watching other offenders come and go other offenders who had committed markedly more serious offences and who have since been released while they remain in prison, unable to obtain parole, for a number of reasons which are so powerfully and devastatingly set out in, in, in the House of Commons Committee uh, report. The, the reasons that it strikes me, coming for the first time understanding the detail of this shocking state of affairs, the reasons include, include the following. One, an outrageous lack of resource um, made available following the imposition of this new and strange um, re regime. Two, the striking fact made in evidence by a number of um, prisoners that prison is not an easy place sometimes to demonstrate 
that one is of a peaceful disposition. It is sometimes a place in which it is unwise to make that clear <coughs> to your fellow inmates. And three, and most um, troubling of all, the fact that is made so strikingly in this report that the, this regime, with its unfair um, and cruel imposition of potentially indeterminate imprisonment, has itself impaired the mental health of um, many of these prisoners in a way that has made it even more difficult for them to satisfy the parole board release test. Um, there are still, I, I think, around 3,000 um, IPP prisoners uh, in prison. Um, that's about a third, a shade over a third, of all those who were um, uh, subjected to these sentences in the first place. That's a lot of prisoners. Um, the um, uh, uh, only, apart from the possibility of a resentencing <coughs> re exercise, which I can see will generate problems but may well be inevitable, and if it's going to happen, it should happen now. The only possibility that I would um, respectfully ask the, minister, uh, the noble Lord the Minister to consider in his response is that canvassed by the um, committee report, namely using the power under Section 128 of LASPO 2012 to reverse the burden of proof for IP pre IPP um, prisoners when they make their applications to the parole board, so that the burden rests on, as it were, the state to demonstrate uh, that the relevant prisoner remains dangerous. That, it seems to me, would reduce some of the unfairness that we are currently addressing. Uh, my Lords, rarely can a report from a select committee have been welcomed with such, uh, such joy uh, by those directly affected by it. Uh, and what perhaps is most welcome about it is its sense of urgency and dispatch. Uh, we have discussed this topic for quite a long time now. We have had warm words and sympathy from ministers, but we have not had evidence of the urgency and dispatch that this report so rightly calls for. Ministers and officials wish to be seen as just, but they know they are practicing a major injustice. They wish to be seen as humane, but they know that they are continuing a monument to inhumanity. Think about this briefly from the point of view of those affected. Prisoners who are told that they are in prison for life, uh, but they can get out if they demonstrate this, attend certain courses, go through certain hoops, and then find that they cannot demonstrate it that the courses are not available, that if they can get on one, they then find they might be moved to another prison before they can attend it. No wonder their mental health has deteriorated. No wonder they don't talk about it. Look at paragraph 49. I don't speak to staff, as any mention of a mental health issue goes on your prison record and will be brought up at board and can block release. The truth of it is we are all suffering from mental health problems, but we are frightened to speak up. Imagine being in that position. Think about the licensee, the person out on licence having to demonstrate for 10 years that they are of good character or whatever, subject to being capriciously taken back into incarceration. Look at paragraph 115, where it tells you that the majority of those taken back into prison have not committed a further offence. They have simply failed to satisfy their parole officer that they should remain out. Uh, think also here about the psychologists involved in this. Um, people who are there to heal, but who know that by giving a correct clinical judgment about the mental health of the prisoner, that they are actually not assisting that prisoner, but condemning him to continue in the circumstances which are the cause of the mental health problem. They feel deeply compromised in the role that they are asked to carry out in prison in dealing with IPP prisoners. One of the, one of the most touching things in the report was the prisoner who said that the best thing that ever happened to him was being sent to a mental hospital during his sentence, because at least there he was treated like a human being. And finally, my lords, I'd ask you to think about the families, because they are serving the sentence too. And with that, I will come to my question to the Minister, which is this. There are two groups representing the families, 
uh, UNGRIP, the United Group for Reform of IPP, and the IPP Committee in Action. They will be lobbying their MPs, the prisoners' MPs, on the 19th of October. Can my noble friend say that he will secure a meeting for them with the Secretary of State and Lord Chancellor either on the 19th or o of October or on, or on some date soon after that because they wish their voice to be heard and they wish ministers to take this up and pursue it properly as this, as this report recommends. Are we forgetting this debate? And a really warm tribute to Sir Bob Neill and his committee. Sir Bob has been a constant supporter of prison reform and it's reflected in this report. And I also send my good wishes to the new prisons minister, Rob Butler MP, who was an assiduous and thoughtful member of the Youth Justice Board during my tenure uh, between 2014 and 2017. My locus in this debate, I was, the, I was the minister who took last vote through the Lords and abolished IPPs, as we thought. And I made it clear that existing IPPs would be dealt with by various means, including uh, the IP prisoners being able to earn their release by various tra training schemes and rehabilitation programmes, as Lord Moylan has just referred to. And of course the truth was that that idea was foiled by various catch-22s to which he referred, including lack of resources. No one has claimed that LASPO denied judges the opportunity to hand down strict sentences, and I, I was um, pleased to hear Lord, Lord Thomas referring to this. And the LASPO regime has stood the test of time. What remains is a hangover which both the, the minister who introduced the IPPs, Lord Blunkett, and the minister who thought he had abolished IPPs have said doesn't work as, uh, as it, we thought it would and remains a stain on our justice system. But let me put a, one shade of doubt into our debate. Um, throughout my time at the Ministry of Justice, uh, attempts at prison reform were knocked back by 10 Downing Street um, by the simple not politically deliverable. And throughout this time, we have had to face the problem that both front benches have been keen to avoid being outflanked to the right by seeming to be soft on prison reform. And I fear that this is still the problem and it's going to start to need a great deal of courage uh, to overcome that. Uh, this is not a plan to set free dangerous criminals, but what a civilised country to, would do. And I hope that Minister has come with a brief accepting the report and co committing the government to legislative action to right this wrong. As I came into the chamber, I received an email from the British Psychological Society, which I will read only one um, sentence from. A resentencing exercise would restore a sense of certainty, hope and fairness. Three vital ingredients to behavioural change, engagement with psychological support and compliance with the law. My Lords, this has been an overwhelming message to Ministers. I hope they're listening. My Lords, I signed up for this debate for two reasons a nagging discomfort about the handful of IPP sentences uh, that I felt myself obliged to impose, not on the most serious criminals, as a recorder of the Crown Court prior to 2012, <coughs> and respect for and solidarity with those uh, noble and noble and learned lords who have done battle on this subject for so many years. May I simply add two stray observations. First, as uh, the noble learned Lord Brown of Eton under Haywood has pointed out, the Justice Committee's statement, uh, the Justice Committee's report, noted that the IPP sentence is unusual in that it detains individuals in prison on the basis of what they might do rather than on the basis of what they have done. It occurred to me that similar comments are often made about the sentencing of terrorists for so called precursor offences and indeed about the effective house arrest of terrorist suspects by executive measures such as TPIMS. The preemptive aspect of counter-terrorism law 
rightly results in particularly anxious public and parliamentary scrutiny. Indeed, the same uncertainty that contributes, uh, according to this report, to the high levels of self-harm and suicide of IPP prisoners was something this House had well in mind when it refused to allow TPIMS uh, to become indefinite, a position to which the Government eventually agreed in the Counterterrorism and Sentencing Act at 2021. When we can get it broadly right where terrorists are concerned, it's depressing that we've still not uh, corrected a manifest injustice to those convicted of ordinary criminal offences, uh, an injustice that was recognised as such not only by Lord Blunkett, but by both, both Michael Gove and Liz Truss when they were Lord Chancellor in the middle of the last uh, decade. Uh, and an injustice that, as the uh, noble Lord Lord Thomas, uh, noble and learned Lord Thomas has said, may even make uh, the subjects of that injustice more dangerous. My Lord, secondly, uh, the committee notes uh, that it was the decision to curtail the usual discretion of judges to determine the most appropriate sentence for each offender that led to the initial uh, proliferation of the IPP sentence. There is there, surely, a cautionary tale. We see in this place repeated proposals for remote control of judicial discretion, whether by minimum sentences in criminal cases uh, or by seeking to influence uh, the grant of remedies in civil cases. Uh, I think of the Environment Act 2021 and, rather more happily, uh, the Judicial Review and Courts Act uh, 2022. Such attempts are liable to cause more problems than they solve uh, because of that most foundational law of all, uh, the law of unintended consequences. That is certainly what we've seen with IPPs. My Lords, I strongly support uh, the Justice Committee's recommendation of a comprehensive resentencing exercise uh, for the reasons that it gives, uh, and I look forward to finding out whether the Minister is able to do so as well. I'm able to maintain my self-denying ordinance. I had <laughs> hoped to give other noble lords more time than um, has been allowed, though I can't work out the arithmetic, I have to say. Um, and noble lords have been particularly succinct. So having spotted the gap, I'm going <laughs> to um, move into it. Um, I've been particularly struck over the last few days uh, by the emails that I've received from family, friends, campaigners in this area who all thought that I was going to be leading on this. Um, and I have thought how much this regime brings the law into disrepute yeah. and what a very serious matter that is. If somebody had written a novel about all of this, we'd be saying it couldn't happen, but it has, and it mustn't go on. My Lords, I'd like to open by thanking the noble lady Baroness Burt and the noble lady Baroness Hamwe for securing this, uh, this debate. Um, I think I agree she made a, gave a masterly introduction of the issue and a comprehensive one as well. I'd also like to my, extend my best wishes uh, to Rob Butler MP, who's the new relevant minister. I served with Rob Butler as a youth magistrate at Highbury Magistrates Court for a, a number of years, and I wish him well. My Lords, we too welcome the JSC report. It pulls no punches. It makes concrete recommendations, which we, I, I list, will listen to the Minister's response to those re recommendations with great interest. As the Noble Lord, Lord Brown, said, um, it's now 10 years from the abolition of the IPP scheme, and there's been a consistent effort from many speakers in this House to, to, to move forward to try and, and find a way of, of resolving the wrong that has been done to so many people languishing in our prisons now. And my noble friend Lord Blunkett has bravely spoken out against the regime which he himself introduced. My Lords, there's been some exceptional uh, uh, contributions uh, today, I would say, but the gist of them is the government needs to respond positively uh, to the, uh, to the uh, 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 and urgently to the recommendations that have been made. And also, I think it's fair to say, take on board the point made by the noble Lord Lord McNally, 
that there is a shade of doubt. We need to acknowledge that. And there is a political decision to be made about the possibility of releasing dangerous prisoners. And it, there needs to be a proper uh, way of reducing those risks. My Lords, I wanted to make one uh, major, one, one point which is different from the points that have been made by other noble Lords, and that is to uh, really speak to the brief from the National Association of Probation Officers who have written to me about this matter. And their point is really uh, covered most fully in paragraphs 93 and 94 of the JSC report. In a nutshell, it's about resourcing. It's about uh, allowing probation officers to do their job properly, to have training, and to provide resources for the, the, uh, the offenders once they've been released and they are out in the community. It's no accident that, they, that there is not adequate support and there is a high uh, level of recall for these prisoners, and that is a problem. And it's a problem which can be partially addressed by the government recognising there is an additional training and resource element for the probation service, and I hope the Noble Lord, the Minister, will specifically address that point because it's one which is, I've been asked to raise here today. My Lords, may I join with uh, many of the speakers in this debate already by uh, thanking the Noble Lady Baroness Hamwee for securing this debate, and may I, see, may I say that how glad I am to see her in her place uh, and to appreciate her succinct contribution to the important debate. I thank also the Noble Lady Baroness Burt uh, for opening the uh, debate uh, and for laying down uh, so many challenges for me to meet in the form of questions. May I, in uh, the spirit of goodwill and uh, cooperation across the whole House, begin by providing her with a specific answer to one of the questions that she raised. The report by Professor Moran on the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway is published today on gov.uk. My Lords, with that expression of delight, perhaps I should sit down, but <laughs> I, have, I have more to say in response to the many points which your Lordships uh, have taken up. My Lords, it is indeed the case that the IPP sentence continues to generate enormous interest concern uh, and challenge in this House, and the Ministry of Justice has certainly felt the strength of feeling in previous uh, sessions uh, from many lo noble lords uh, on this matter. Uh, my lords, I, I acknowledge um, the work of the probation service to which the noble lord, Lord Ponsonby of Shulbreed, uh, made reference a moment ago uh, in their part uh, in addressing the very difficult problems uh, which have emerged as a result of this piece of legislation. As Noble Lords will know, the IPP sentence became available for the courts to use from April 2005. When the sentence was abolished in December 2012, there were over 6,000 offenders in prison serving an IPP sentence. Since that time, the Parole Board has released a substantial number of those prisoners on licence though I assure the House that we do recognise that there is still much more to be done. On the 30th of June uh, this year, there were 1,492 offenders in prison uh, serving the IPP sentence who had never been released. On the same date, there were 1,434 offenders serving the IPP sentence in prison following recall. In light of these numbers, I should here reaffirm the Government's commitment through the work uh, of Her I beg your pardon, His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, HMPPS, to support, firstly, those serving the IPP sentence in prison to reduce their risk to the point where the parole board, in the exercise of its independent function and discretion, judges that they are safe to release. And secondly, those serving the IPP sentence in the community to progress to the point where the Parole Board, in the exercise of that same discretion, judges that their IPP sentence may safely be terminated. Our commitment uh, will be delivered through the HMPPS Action Plan. As your Lordships will be aware, it has long been the Government's intention to review and refresh the Action Plan once the Ju Justice Select Committee 
published its report following the IPP inquiry. And my Lords, we welcome the fact that after a year-long inquiry, the collation of the evidence base to which uh, the noble Lord, Lord Anderson of Ipswich and Lord Thomas of Coombe Geith referred, um, was published on the 28th of September, and that means that we can now review thoroughly this important collation of evidence and recommendations in the context of consideration of our next steps. But I should emphasise, my Lords, that uh, the Government has not stood idly by awaiting the publication of this report, but work has been done to ameliorate uh, matters for persons serving such sentences, uh, as I will advise your Lordships. My Lords, the Justice Select Committee, as your Lordships have noted, has laid out a clear recommendation for a new IPP action plan and a new approach to its oversight. The Committee uh, wants focused, actionable guidance to include that, ensure that the plan has a clear strategic priority and ownership and for HMPPS to deliver more in terms of fixed timeframes and performance measures. The Government welcomes the publication uh, of the Committee's report and views it as a real opportunity to take stock and identify areas for possible improvement. As I've observed, HMPPS has been working very diligently over a considerable period to deliver improved prospects for those serving IPP sentences. However, we must always be responsive to new information and take further steps to ensure that this work is robust, structured and properly directed. A full government response will be provided to the Justice Select Committee by the 28th, November, 28th of November of this year with an updated IPP action plan to follow afterwards. Uh, my Lords, I emphasise that the 28th of November is the final date. And I know, my Lords, that my noble friend Lord Bellamy, uh, the Minister with responsibility in this area, will, be very will very much be looking forward to sharing and discussing progress on this with your Lordships over the course of the coming months. The noble Lord Lord Thomas of Coombe Geith, in his uh, powerful submission, um, acknowledged the importance of evidence and an evidence base upon which to work. Uh, my Lords, uh, I emphasise that um, such an evidence base, together with the facts and statistics already available to the government, uh, must be subject to proper interpretation and analysis. But, my Lords, I hope that this will not amount to the uh, procrastination which my noble friend Lord Garnier uh, styled it, uh, potentially styled it at least, or indeed to equivocation. My Lords, whilst our focus is now on revising the action plan to address the Committee's recommendations, I think it important in a debate such as this to give that short overview uh, of what has been delivered, of what has been achieved thus far in support of bettering the, the prospect of those serving an IPP sentence um, and of permitting them to progress through the system. Indeed, many of the improvements which have been delivered in recent years will remain key features of the IPP Action Plan as they've been shown to be effective in supporting progression. In September 2016, a joint HMPPS and Parole Board IPP Action Plan was introduced, overseen by a board of senior representatives from prisons, probation, the Parole Board, health services and psychology services. I think I may lay particular emphasis on that uh, latter component uh, because of the uh, profound concern which your Lordships have exhibited in relation to mental health uh, of persons uh, who are imprisoned in this way. This early version focused significantly on improving the processes associated with the delivery of an efficient and timely parole process. At the time, there was a significant backlog of oral hearings which had a particular bearing on the prospects for IPP prisoners to secure progression. But through the work outlined in the first action plan, the efficient flow and handling of cases improved significantly, and that background was eliminated. Once the parole process was operating efficiently, focus shifted very largely to what HMPPS could and would do to support IPP prisoners so that they could embark on their parole reviews with realistic hopes of showing the parole board 
that the statutory release test was met in their case. And then, as in each year from 2016, the parole board released hundreds from their IPP sentence for the first time, and as more were being managed in the community on an IPP licence, HMPPS began to explore what was needed to support those eligible to apply for the supervision requirements of their IPP licence to be suspended and later to uh, apply for their IPP licence to be terminated altogether. Uh, my Lords, let me now turn to um, specific achievements uh, of the IPP action plan thus far. I, I start with the case review initiative. This is delivered by Psychology Services. These, my Lords, are comprehensive reviews, vital to identifying the most appropriate pathways for individuals, especially those with complex needs and challenging presentations, of which the significant minority, I beg your Lordship's pardon, majority of those who remain in custody have. It's important, however, to note that these case reviews are not a ticket to release, but are absolutely a key step to helping practitioners hone in on the best course of action to enable those individuals to take progressive steps. My Lords, the Department considers it impressive that almost every post-tariff unreleased IPP prisoner currently in prison has now received such a case review. The initiative has delivered well. Between July 2016 and April 2022, 1,877 thorough reviews were completed, with many individuals going on from this platform to complete the work required to secure their next progressive step. In fact, 552 prisoners in this cohort have subsequently been released, and a further 537 secured a progressive move to open conditions. It's clear that these reviews have, in conjunction with prison and community offender managers, led to improved individual pathways to progression, notwithstanding the fact that many are still struggling to progress due to their challenging behaviour, complex needs and risks, the risks, that is, that they pose. Such cases are revisited in terms of an update of the original case review and further multidisciplinary discussions on next steps. Another key success of the action plan is the planning and implementation of three specialist progression regimes, which brings the total of such regimes to four. They collectively offer 385 places. These regimes at Her Majesty, His Majesty's Prison, Warren Hill, at Errolstoke, the Humber and at Buckley Hall operate in closed adult male prisons and provide opportunities for prisoners to gain a fuller understanding of their risks and problematic behaviours and support to address those behaviours and risks. Progression regimes aim to reintroduce the responsibilities, tasks and routines associated with daily life in the community, to test prisoners' readiness to respond appropriately to trust where it is placed in them and to pursue actively activities and relationships which, which um, support rehabilitation. Uh, my Lords, the, the system and the government is conscious of the pressures posed on persons who have spent a long time incarcerated on returning uh, to ordinary life. My Lords, whilst not all IPP prisoners would be ready to move to a progression regime due to the unique regime offering increased freedoms and responsibilities, it has proved an important opportunity for many to secure future release and will be for many more who arrive there in the future. Also worthy of note is the delivery of the IPP Progression Panels Initiative, led by the Probation Service, which supports progression for those serving the IPP sentence in prison and in the community. These panels offer a multidisciplinary approach to risk management and progression, enabling cases which may have stalled to be put back on the right progression pathway. The panels are informed by the psychology uh, services case reviews and are an important part of the wider toolkit to improve progression of IPP offenders. These are, <coughs> are used both prior to release, but mainly following release to enable the effective management of individuals whilst on license in the community. To date, 
Over 6,600 IPP progression panels have been held across community and custodial settings. The final success that I would like to highlight today to your Lordships is the addition to the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act earlier this year, which requires the Secretary of State automatically to refer every eligible IPP offender to the Parole Board for consideration of licence termination. This takes effect once 10 years has elapsed since their first uh, release and then annually thereafter. Now, my Lords, I note that that period is one which is challenged uh, by the report uh, of the Joint Select Committee uh, and the Department will look forward to engaging with that matter in due course. This is something, my Lords, that your Lordship's House has certainly played an important part in delivering. And may I acknowledge, uh, and join with others, I should say, in acknowledging um, the uh, work and approach uh, of the Noble Lord, Lord Blunkett, uh, in relation to uh, consideration uh, of the impact, the value, and the merit of the IPP sense. I think my noble friend, Lord Garnier, in particular, made mention of that, but others did as well. This amendment built further on what was previously delivered through the IPP Action Plan, which is, was to amend policy to seek proactively to ensure all eligible cases for license termination made application to the Parole Board. Every eligible case will be considered by the Parole Board and, where successful, will lead to the IPP license and the IPP sentence as a whole being brought to a definitive end. As I say, my Lord, I'm aware that uh, many of your Lordships did not consider that this uh, change went far enough and have pushed for a reduction on that period before individuals are eligible for consideration to have their IPP licences terminated. And that featured, as I say, in the uh, recommendations of the Joint Select Committee. Uh, although their primary recommendation has sought to go much further, to set up a time-limited expert committee, as your Lordships have heard, to advise on the practical implementation of a resentencing exercise, which the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice could then consider. As stated previously, all recommendations within the report will be considered thoroughly. And, however, I'm unable to comment on the Government's views on the report's recommendations until that formal response is available. My Lords, whilst the successes coming from the IPP Action Plan, which I've sought to outline, are certainly encouraging, um, it is crucial at the same time to recognise the enormous challenges that are faced in working with this cohort to best effect and in the challenges that a refreshed IPP action plan will need to tackle. As the number of IPP prisoners who have never been released continues to, continues to decrease, um, the proportion of those who remain in prison who have committed more serious offences and whose <clears throat> cases are particularly complex continues to grow. These prisoners, when not being released by the parole board, are still assessed to pose a high risk of committing further violent or sexual offences. And uh, his confirmation um, of the expression that your Lordship was using. My Lords, these risks and associated behaviours must be addressed. And this has to be taken in mind when we balance, when we consider IPP sentences because there is a risk management component involved in that, and it is not a simple task. Uh, my Lords, the Government's priority continues to be to protect the public, but we remain committed fully to doing all we can to support the safe progression of those serving IPP sentences. As your Lordships have emerged... My Lords, at the risk of prolonging my noble friend's speech, may I ask, as I sense he might be sitting down shortly, what he can say in response to mm. my question that he will do in order to secure a meeting for the families with the Secretary of State on the 19th of October or as soon after that as possible. I can give my noble friend an assurance that there will be engagement with the bodies to which he referred in his submission. My Lords, as your Lordships recognise, it is a mark, I think, of the health of society that it extends compassion to victims of crime, uh, but also uh, to those uh, who find themselves in custody as a result of having committed it. Uh, my Lords, um, the uh, 
proposals which the government will bring forward uh, once it has considered the terms of the GSC's report uh, will, I hope, assist that uh, and permit people uh, to reform and to enter into society uh, to lead as full and useful a life as they may. Uh, <clears throat>